Good afternoon. No, wait, I think it's still morning. So my bad, but it's been a really, really busy morning here at Nurturing Big Ideas. And I'm looking out the window here in Binghamton. And guess what? The sun's out today. The sun is out. It's going to be 88 degrees. It's going to be really hot and muggy. But, you know, if we walk the dog at the park, it's not so bad because it's really shady and beautiful and just relaxing. So that's what I think we'll do later today. Today on Nurturing Big Ideas Smart Conversations, I have a unique, um, talented, and really interesting guest, Julie Trellstad. Is that how yep. we say it? Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Julie, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Let me tell you a little bit about Julie, and then we have some fascinating things to talk about. I mean, Julie and I could probably just go on talking for hours and hours. Julie Trellstad is the founder and publisher of 82 Stories, a book production studio for content creators, and Julie Inc., a book marketing consultancy. She's been publishing books for over three decades. So Julie, I think then that must mean you started when what, you were 12? Thank you. She's, work and, to... <laughs> she's worked with hundreds of authors who have collectively sold millions of books at Reader's Digest, the Taunton Press, and John Wiley and Sons as my own publishing, as well as your own publishing company, which she sold in 2010. Is that right? Did I say That's that? That's right. Yeah, I had my company here in White Plains, the Plain White Press. I sold it to Fox Chapel Publishing. Which is a as whole. an acquisition editor in traditional publishing, owner of a publishing company, and as the digital rights director for a large literary agency in New York City, can you tell when we talk to her, she's going to have a lot to tell us? <laughs> Julie knows firsthand what makes some books soar and others fail to take off. Her goal is to demystify the often obtuse and discouraging world of book publishing and help writers succeed in producing, publishing, and marketing their books. And Julie, that is exactly what I'm all about. But you have a fascinating, fascinating journey. Tell us how this journey started. Well, Yvonne, I studied architecture in school, <laughs> and um, weirdly, in my particular class, I seemed to be the one who handed in the nicest essay, so I won an internship at an architectural magazine right out of college, and when I got there, I discovered the cool thing about working and publishing is that I got to hobnob with all the big and famous architects and really get a view on perspective on the industry that I would have never seen if I was working as you know a drafts person in, in, yeah. in the trenches. And I was just fascinated by what everyone was doing and the world of magazines, um, which later led to the world of books. So mm -hmm. I went from magazine editor to book editor. Um, at first working on very professional, uh, for the profession, architecture books, like at John Wiley and Sons, mm -hmm. and then later moving towards the consumer end of things at the Taunton Press and um, Reader's Digest, where we did these home improvement manuals. And I also worked for Sterling, which was part of Barnes & Noble, and we also did home improvement, but also wine books and um, craft books and, you know, making things with wreaths. You know, those well, I, I think books. we have a whole lot of those books, just to let yeah. you know. I think my oh, cool. a whole lot of those books. Um, yeah, and after that, I started my own publishing company, which I uh, you introduced me at. It was the Plain White Press of White Plains. Uh, my kids were teenagers, and I said, like, hey, I can do this better, which was maybe a little bit premature. <laughs> because oh, well. I started a publishing company, and because of my connections, I got national distribution right away. And then I sold a book to Borders and you know what happened to Borders and that's what happened to my publishing company. Darn, darn. Ah. <laughs> you try, you know. Yeah. Well, but still, I mean, it's so fascinating. The architecture makes me think of the fact that building and in, in, in our book, the How to Write a Book book, we talk about how writing a book is just like building a house mm -hmm. because the architecture 
is so you have to do this first, like the foundation, and you have to understand how big is the house, how many rooms. I mean, mm. you know, so we said how many chapters, how, where will, how will you lay it out? How will people find where they're supposed to go? So that's just fascinating. To Don't me. forget the plumbing. It's probably equivalent to grammar. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I don't think we associated it. Maybe we did. I think Tom associated it with the wiring and the, the things, but he did mention plumbing because um, it is when you think of writing and publishing a book, it's more than just sitting down at the computer, right? Yeah. Tell us, tell us about what you're doing right now. Oh, you know, it's such an interesting time in the publishing industry. I can tell you, like, there's so much happening so fast. I don't know that anyone's got their finger on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, self-publishing is growing enormously. What are there, 4,000 books published every week? Is that right? Or oh, it's just like... 4,000? I, I think so. Yeah, I, I think, think so, so on Amazon every week. Yeah. But now think about that. Amazon has only been around for what, 11 years or so. I and know. The, you know, it's just like that didn't even exist a decade ago. And, and, and when I was first publishing, they were just opening new Barnes and Noble stores. So like the industry was in a totally different phase. And now we have a situation where we only have five major publishers, soon to be four. And even big companies that are in the next tier, like I heard that Workman Publishing is being sold to Hachette. So it's just like, um, you know, there's such consolidation. And what I'm seeing, I work with a lot of traditionally published authors. Agents usually recommend me to their clients about building their platforms. And what we're seeing is that if you're traditionally published, unless you're like the very top 1%, you're not getting marketing from the publisher and you still have to do it yourself, yeah. which is super frustrating, right? Because <laughs> shouldn't they be doing that? I don't know. But it's sort of like, and on the other hand, of course, if you're self-publishing, you have to do marketing yourself and you have to run an entire author business. Yeah. And um and what I'm starting to see is that that world is working differently uh, for literary or for how to or for genre fiction. They're kind of, you know, different approaches are working yeah. for different kinds of books. And I think it's still all sorting out. And Amazon is dominating everything and everybody right now. So I honestly think the opportunity is where can we sell books that's not Amazon? Because we're going to be out in the world and in different places. Like, so last year we did a book um, about tomatoes and I had a former author of mine come back to me and we repurposed a book he had done early in his career. And we sold a bunch of copies to a garden center who was sending them out with all their gardening kits because their business was booming last year because everyone was home yeah, gardening. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was really fun because we got to do a very large print run and we sold them through this company. And then they give them away, but they also resell them themselves on, on Amazon too. <laughs> but we didn't have to well, do Well, see Amazon. how fascinating that is. And I, I really love what you said about finding other places to sell books besides mm -hmm. Amazon. Um, Amazon is like the, the, the big gorilla in the room. So you kind of have to look at it. You, you can't just ignore it, but let's definitely, I mean, I'm on board with you of finding other ways to get the books out there. And um, I do love print on demand. That's mm -hmm. how I started. My publishing company was a print on demand publishing company, but a lot of authors who start out as self-published, perhaps using print on demand, can then um, go into traditional publishing if they're very successful. Yeah. Now, something you mentioned about how to be successful is the marketing. And, and it's like the authors, they know today that they have to do something. They don't know what. What, what? do you advise people? <laughs> Yeah, it's really, um, I, I, you know, it seems like authors are just being told, do social media. Like, yeah, well. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. I don't really know. Because I think, again, the world 10 years ago, right? Um, nine years ago, 10 years ago, Twitter was, was brand new. Facebook was really in its infancy. Yep. And what happened at that time, 10, a decade ago, was that when authors got on, 
they could blow up and build an audience really yep. quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that was true for three or four years that you could just jump on there and you suddenly had the world at your fingertips mm -hmm. and it was pretty easy. Like I was an early Twitter adopter and I got a lot of followers. It is not easy today because it's just like Amazon. So Amazon builds this, um, you know, 4,000 books a month, like who reads many books? Um, and the same thing is true with social media that everything is very, very crowded. So the people who are tending to succeed in social media right now are either the ones who are early adopting whatever is new and next. So um, I have a friend who's on TikTok and she's been able to explode a TikTok following. She's telling me that you can still do that today. Go, go do TikTok. And actually um, on my website, there is a free TikTok for authors course if you wanna know how. Holy cow, um, yeah. I'll send you that link so you can share it with your audience. Yeah, and, um, but that won't last very long. <laughs> Next year is going to be something else. So you have to be like, I'm really into playing the game. Now, on the other side, if you want a solid strategy that's going to be timeless, that's going to last forever, I'm a big fan of the thousand true fans approach. Are you familiar with this approach? It sounds you heard familiar. of it. Uh huh. Go it's ahead. an approach It Google a thousand true fans. You'll find a bunch of videos that describes exactly what it is. It came out of the music world, independent musicians, yes. where this idea is if you have a thousand people in your network and that's like nobody, you know, compared to the, the size of the yes. universe and yes. the number of people on earth and even in your town, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. If you can have a thousand people on an email list and keep them engaged and have them buy everything that you create. So if you're a novelist and you write two novels a year or you write a novel and you write short stories or, um, you know, Substack is big now. So you can do a paid newsletter and their fiction writers, you know, ha having fans pay for their stories as they go. Um, but if you can just get a thousand and they're really engaged. I'm not a thousand people on a mailing list, but a thousand people who open every email that you have, mm -hmm. then you can build an author career on that. And it's, it's pretty solid. And how do you get to a thousand fans? And there's a lot of different ways to do it. Social media is great to like bring people to your email list. Social media doesn't work very well to sell books, but it does help people know who you are and find you. And then, you know, if they like what you're saying, you can reel them in and get them on your newsletter where you can have more relationship with them. Well, Some people are using community too, like um, things yes. like Facebook groups or circle instead of a newsletter. So mm -hmm. it's just a matter of having a place to put all these people who will buy everything you, you write. Well, but the, but the other big part of that is there's work involved. Yeah. You don't <laughs> yes. suddenly create this newsletter and have these thousand adoring fans mm. and you know, people are finding it so difficult, as you said. I, I will attest to back in 15 years ago, when all of this began, I was at the, at the leading edge of it. So I started a blog before anybody else was blogging. And it bumped up my business because people were noticing me. It was very um, provocative because it was about my book, Dickless Marketing. And I, love that. <laughs> and I yeah. you know, I was invited also to speak. So speaking, I think, mm, is one yes. way that, that people should people should be pursuing the, this thousand fans thing is so powerful, but don't think you're going to get those thousand fans fans by putting a little bit up on LinkedIn and a little bit up on Facebook or whatever. Right. Get yourself out there in front of the fans. Yvonne, it's exactly that. It's a practice. So um, what I would recommend, especially if you're a nonfiction writer, plan to do three or four speaking gigs a year. Plan to write an article for LinkedIn or on a blog or anywhere, um, try to do that at least once a month, probably twice a month. Yeah. You should be on social media for 15 minutes daily. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you have to post every day, but you need to be engaging with people right. and collecting because you'll, there's the easiest way I find to get people on an email list is to make friends with them, have a conversation that goes on for a little while on LinkedIn and Twitter. And like, actually when somebody connects with me on LinkedIn now, I always invite them to to follow me, to subscribe to my newsletter. And I will subscribe to theirs mm -hmm. um, because I feel like it's a great way and it's a personal ask. And I, and I don't yeah. do it like right out of the gate. I do it after I've had a conversation or even a few interactions with that person. 
Right. I, again, it's building the relationship, as you said, and yeah. it's, it's, you can't build a relationship by just going to Twitter and sharing somebody's tweet. I mean, it, that I do that because I know so many people on Twitter, because again, I was one of the first people on Twitter, but probably 90% of the people I know on Twitter are people that came from my blog pause days. And they're not really part of the nurturing big idea stuff I do now, but that's all mm -hmm. right. I love sharing their content. And then I do share relevant content from people like you that is going to be useful to exactly. anyone who might come by who is interested and they might say, hey, that Yvonne, she knows some, some really smart people. <laughs> I should talk right. to her. Um, and I do it on LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been really good for me because it's a professional I agree. platform. I agree. I love LinkedIn and LinkedIn is it's easier to have conversations and, meet, and I met you on LinkedIn, Yvonne. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so exactly. it, it's That's easy to find there. people and it's friendly. It's not snarky. I don't know. I, I like, I, I really like LinkedIn and um, you can do blog posts on LinkedIn. You can create a group on LinkedIn. You can video is very effective on LinkedIn. If you can do one minute videos um, once a week, a one minute video on LinkedIn oh, can go a long oh, Julie, way. Once a week of video, listen to you. Like a one minute, just one I minute. Don't want to. <laughs> one minute. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I do want to. I do. Here's my problem. And yeah, in what um I'm so good at helping other people and I'm so woefully bad at helping myself. But um if I'm going to be doing a video and it's one minute, and by the way, everybody, one minute can be a long time. You can say a whole lot of stuff in one minute. Yes. You need to strategize it. Don't, I mean, you can, if you're really comfortable with it, sit down and just talk off the cuff. I've done that, but strategize these videos, right? What are you going to say? Do a one, one minute video um, for a week, once a day, and have it be a series. Exactly. Um, a really something I like, and, and actually I haven't posted a video in a while, but I'm, I'm actually, I'm doing what you're doing. I'm plotting it out in a spreadsheet. <laughs> like these are the ones I want to do. These are all the topics they want to cover. Mm -hmm. And, and I plan to like be working on it in the fall. But so like, if you write a blog post, say once a week, mm -hmm. uh, you post that on a Monday and then you can, uh, talk in your video about what you wrote in the blog post or a question you got from somebody who asked a question about your blog post. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, you've got those two posts and the rest of the, and then maybe you repost some really interesting resource that you find. And then the rest of it is just interaction. So yeah, it is writing to me, writing the blog post takes the longest. <laughs> yeah. Writing, um, it used to be so easy, Julie, because in yeah. the, in the early days, when we first started, the rule was around 500 words, not true today. Uh, Google wants, yep. Yep. Long form thousand, 2000 words. Um, so it was 500 words and you didn't put images. If you did put an image, it was some little tiny thing, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't like today, that image better be relevant and, and crisp and clear, and it better speak to the blog post. Um, and, you know, back then, we didn't, I put my picture up, not everybody did, but it was a little teeny tiny thumbnail picture that you could hardly see. And today it's just like, like no, hey. get yourself <laughs> out there, right? <laughs> Yeah, you have to be a fashionista too and have yeah. like styled photos. Yeah. No. I'm like, who has I time for that? To my granddaughter, she dresses me. She dresses you. Like, I have to say, I took a course this year that was life changing. It was called Minimum Viable Video. Again, I will send you that. I will send you that link and you can send people to this course because it changed my life in terms of being able to show up on video without really sweating it. And um, I, they taught you how to do one minute videos as well as um, longer videos for YouTube or even shorter ones, like a, another thing they recommend. And I think this would be useful for authors too, would be to do video email. Use one of the, like Boom Boom are one of the new tools that allows you to like send a video in your email. Wow. 
but you have to be comfortable with it. It's just like, nobody's doing it yet. So it still gets you to stand out. Now, 10 years, everyone will be doing it and it'll be too late and you'll have to do whatever's next. Maybe uh, right, 3D right. avatars of you and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in the end, in the end, what you're saying and what, what I want everyone to understand is that you have to put yourself out there. The world is not going to flock to your website to buy your book, or if you're traditionally published, your publisher may help you to a certain extent, but you still have to get out there. I mean, Julie, I acted as a um, agent for a really smart guy who had a huge platform, thousands and thousands of people. And he wrote a book about um, social media in the early, early days of social media. We couldn't get anyone to pick that book up and it was the best book. So I think he finally self-published it, but that goes my point being that don't let things stop you. And no, if, don't. right. Yeah. If, if video is stopping you, Julie has your answer. We're going to put that link in the, in the blog post. And if you're, if you don't think you're a public speaker, hmm, my daughter teaches public speaking. I'll introduce you to her. The point being, right, this is something I tell my clients and I ask upfront, do you want to speak? Are you going to take this book on the road? And they all say yes, because you have to. You have to. And, you know, what's interesting, you know, the way you're saying that makes me really think about the book as the lightning rod, right? Mm -hmm. That where lightning can strike if you have this, if you have the book, you give yourself, you open so many doors, you have so many opportunities, you have something to endlessly talk about. You've already created enough content for a thousand posts, probably. Yeah. And, you know, that can be and done workshops in workshops and webinars. Various workshops, webinars, everything like the book. There's your foundation. Like, well, the book itself has a foundation, but the book is a foundation of your author career. And Unfortunately, I think some people have the imagination that the book itself will bring the lightning <laughs> and, and maybe in that rare case, but actually I think you basically have to hold it up to the sky where it can strike. <laughs> it's just not going like to like do it by itself. <laughs> yes. um, so let's talk a little bit about the, con the other ideas of a not Amazon and um, mm -hmm. kind of bulk orders. So sure. I want my authors to um, be brave and look at the possibilities of where can you um, sell this book in bulk? Yeah. And, and how can you sell this book in bulk? So one author that I worked with years ago, her former employer uh, really loved what she was doing. And he would buy case quantities of her book and give them to every new employee. Amazing. Right? So think out of the box that way. I actually worked for a literary agent, and this is maybe not the best example, but he wrote a book about writing a blockbuster novel. And with every rejection letter he sent, he had an ad for the book. He didn't send the book. It was just like, you can buy my book. <laughs> oh, that's something else. Wow. Well, so talk about, um, you and I were talking earlier about uh, case quantities mm -hmm. and having your book, not necessarily, you can still put it on Amazon, but what are our other options? Well, the other options are like, so for instance, you know, a lot of people in e-commerce now are doing drop shipping, which means that you are um, putting inventory in a warehouse. So you don't have to put a lot of inventory. I mean, Amazon offers their own fulfillment by Amazon. You can, you can send case quantities to Amazon and have them pick them out of the case as opposed to print on demand. It's one option, but there are tons of these warehouses. There's one I like to use. It's called PSSC. It's the, I think it's publisher's specialty. I'm not, it's definitely PSSC. And what they do is they do drop shipping for authors specifically and publishers. And all they handle is that it's a warehouse that just handles books. Wow. And so they can integrate with your e-commerce system. So if you have Shopify or any kind of e-commerce on your website, you can have them set it up so that somebody orders a book from your website and then they send it direct. So the difference is like Amazon's going to take, if it's a paperback, they're going to take 60% of that list price. 
you know, or 70, depending on how much it costs them to print and ship. Whereas with this warehouse, and you can even charge your client shipping or make it free, it's up to you. Yeah, right. um, you get full retail price. So with Amazon, you may get $6 for your book and you're going to have to price it low because they like like low prices there. Yeah. Whereas yeah. suppose you could have your professional book for $30 that is very desirable and people don't mind paying that and you get the full $30 when these guys ship it minus, you know, the cost of postage and, and a couple bucks for the fulfillment. Well, so it's a real also the cost that the that you printed the, it in the first place. You would run a big print run. How You'd big run a big print run. run. Right. And so if it's a paperback book, though, you could do 300 copies and they might cost two dollars each. Right. Ah. So, you know, the amount of profit you can make on each book sale, if you're selling it direct to your customer or shipping it direct or shipping carton quantities to every speaking venue, or you can write it into your speaking contract that they're going to purchase a copy of your book for everyone. And you go and you put it on every seat before you speak. Yes. Um you know, and the thing is like a warehouse like PSSC, and there's a lot of warehouses can manage that for you where you don't have to have books in your, in your garage. Again, it, you just don't have to, because the world is very much set up for these e-commerce businesses. So if you think, if you put more on the hat, like the people who are selling scarves or shoes, mm -hmm. as opposed to somebody who's selling a book and say, Amazon's the only place, it's like, it's a consumer product. So you can right. sell it anyway. Right. Right. Well, plus, if you're doing this, you were talking earlier that the quality is a little bit better. So. It is. You can get color, French flaps, like um, all these things that would really set the package apart, make it tactile and beautiful. You also have more options in the size. You know, you can do like they basically print it on an eight and a half by 11 sheet and they'll chop it down to any size and bind it just the way you want. Um, whereas print on demand has very set sizes. That's so interesting. I know Tom is going to be interested in that, but it it's um, definitely for my nonfiction clients and my um, advice to them to get speaking gigs, what we work on with them a little bit. I mean, I'm not the marketer. I don't want anybody to come back and say, can you help me market my book? Nope, I'm <laughs> not your marketer. I know because I know people, smart people like Julie, I know a little bit about marketing, um, but you know, we are trying to get them on podcasts because I think mm. right now, because it's so hard to get the speaking in person um, ideas or places to go, get on podcasts because then this builds up both, by the way, any podcaster wants someone who has a book. So <clears throat> if you have a book, you're going to jump ahead of someone who doesn't have a book. Um, depending, of course, you've got to find the right podcast. You've got to be in the right channel, in the right genre. All of those things that we talked about earlier is you, this is the work that you kind of have to do, folks. But if you're doing this, you're building up a, a nice little uh, media page for yourself of all these podcasts you've been on. And now when you go to do a in-person speaking, whether it's a keynote or something else, you not only have a book, you have, look, I, I've been interviewed and I've talked here and there and I've, you know, been on these amazing podcasts, right? That is great advice. Absolutely. Well, the only caveat I have with that is like fiction podcasts have gotten really, really challenging this year. Um, we've tried to place, you know, I think, lot, again, it's just like things go in cycles, right? And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the pandemic maybe have a, has affected things in a couple of ways. One is like all the in-person events got canceled. So everyone wanted to be on podcasts and they just got booked up. Like we had a client this year, he's not even appearing till next year, his book came out in the spring. So <laughs> we just, it just wasn't available. Um, less so I think in nonfiction because you're gonna be targeting, you know, a special interest area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I definitely think that it is, everyone's starting a podcast. I mean, that's the other thing. You can always start your own podcast and <laughs> kind of build up. It's kind of like instead of my newsletter, I have a podcast or mm -hmm. or one or both. But um, in the end, it involves a strategic plan, strategic marketing plan. Yeah. And basically what I'm just loving this idea of this this. Um, print runs that you talked about. I'm mm -hmm. loving the idea that using that can really be beneficial for nonfiction authors. 
um, because they can then do a promotion and send out books, you know. They can like, it's a great lead magnet, my God, to, yeah. re to receive something in the mail. Yeah. I mean, and, and it will cost you a few dollars, but I mean, the, it's part the of impact your budget. and the quality of that would really, people don't throw books away, which is, you know, look at look behind me. They just don't throw them away. Yeah. So they will stick with you. And like another thing that's so easy to do, it maybe requires a thousand words, like as much as one blog post would be to do a workbook or a planner. Yeah. If you're a coach and you have that and then you print it, you know, and have it in the warehouse and you ship it to every new client or every new prospect. And you're just like, you're golden um, you because you've it. given them like we a tool. <laughs> yes, it's a tool. We just yeah. did um, a, a book with a client and she created a workbook. I'm going to go back to her and talk to her about this idea also, because we we had not, and at this point until I talked to you, thought about the whole um, printing other than Amazon idea. But I'm really intrigued, and I think this is a really fantastic way for some of our authors to go. Um, tell us a little bit about. So you said earlier when we were talking that not only is the quality better for these print runs, but you could do color. Yeah, um, it surprised me. Last time I did a quote uh, with McNaughton Gun. This is a printer I used a lot. Um, they basically said, the quote came back basically if 25% or less of the ink coverage in the book, which in other words, I think you know what that means. It just means not like fully saturated with ink was color. It was no more than black and white. It's just like, I can have yes, blue headings on every page. I can do my little graphics and pages. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. All these nonfiction authors have these charts and these graphs and these things yes. like that. Make like, them color. Color is so expensive. Back in the day, it was like, no, you can't do color. This is just like my yeah, mind. Ingram Spark actually has a an economy color version now, like Ingram, the print on the Ingram Spark print on demand. Mm -hmm. Depending on the length of the book, it's pretty affordable. Um, it's not ridiculous, but it's it's a thinner paper. Um, I think it uses the same technology that the that the short run does. But I just love, you know, the short run really gives you just all this more opportunity to do okay. things that are more visual. And another thing I have clients do is both. You don't have to do them exclusively. So you could still have your black and white print on demand to fulfill any random Amazon orders you have. And then you have the special version of your book that people can only get from you. You know, that's plus, enhanced color, extrovert, you know, whatever. Yeah. I mean, plus if you're using it at a speaking event, you can take the time to sign it. I mean, mm -hmm. you'll be there to it, it, hear this wonderful book. And it, like you said, people don't throw books away. I, in my um, book as business card ebook, I tell people all the time that that business card can get lost. It can get put in a pocket and forgotten, but this book is not, it is going to stay there. And um, people immediately, right. Immediately think you're smarter because you wrote a book. I love that. <laughs> Instant intel. It's like wearing glasses, right? <laughs> glasses, book, guaranteed smile. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the social um, signifiers, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the idea is that um, this is your tool. I call it your product. I tell people all the time. It's a book, but it's a product because you're a business professional and this book is going to um, gain you speaking events. It's going to help you build webinars, workshops, communities, groups, whatever it is you choose, masterminds. Um, and it's going to get you respect and attention because all the people out there in the world who are watching or not watching, whoever's watching, I'll tell you, and you can tell me what you think, <laughs> if this is right or wrong. But I say it all the time. Every time I go into a networking group or meet people and say, have you ever thought of writing a book? Every single person says, oh yeah, I'd love to write a book. Well, I don't have time. I can't do with this. I can't. So guess what? When you're the one that writes the book, all those people who didn't write their book are looking at you like, wow. Is that it's, true? Do you? Yeah, it is. It's just, I find that almost everyone has a book in them. 
most people don't get out of them. <laughs> That's <laughs> what a book stay, coach is stay for. Stuck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm for. I you, get you need a book coach. You need a book happen. coach or a ghostwriter or just time to write. But it, time it, to write plus a book coach. <laughs> but it's worthwhile because it leaves a legacy, yeah. everybody. This is more than just you telling your story or helping people build their business because you've done it and you can um, help them over the rough spots. Mm -hmm. This is a legacy that you're leaving. And I want more women to do this because mm -hmm. there aren't enough women's books out there in the business world. Okay. When a, a woman starts or wants to start a business and she's looking for guidance, wherever she goes, bookstore, Amazon, um, uh, Barnes and Noble, she's going to find 99% of the books are written by men. Yeah. So we need more women's voices out there um, helping women achieve their dreams. And, you know, and realize you have a very particular point of view that no one else has. I think a lot of people like, oh, what am I to write a book? It's like, you are you. You're going to write a book that only you can write and convey knowledge and experience that only you have had. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes your book very valuable. And there's, there's hundreds and thousands of other people out there, a lot of women who are looking for that book. Besides... Mm -hmm. We have to go. We're having such a good time here. I know. Um, we can talk again. Besides, if you want. <laughs> besides the fact, and I've said this before, and I will say it again with you, if I'm looking at a book to help me build a business, a particular business, I don't buy just one kind or one author. I'm going to look at all of the authors on the shelf, and I might buy five. So every time someone says, well, you know, my book isn't any different than this. Well, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Like you said. Your viewpoint and your story is a little bit different. So when people are looking, they want a whole bunch of those kinds of books. Exactly. And your point is exactly right. People buy armloads of books. There's a lot of people in this country who don't buy books, but people who do buy lots of them. <laughs> so, and it's never, it's rarely you're going to choose one or another. You're going to, you're just like, oh. I'll just add to the stack. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So people have yeah. them on their, their bed stands like I do. Anyway, anyway. <laughs> we're at the end, Julie. I, I think we could talk for, for another hour. Um, and maybe, maybe what will happen is we'll have to have you back to talk further because you really have shared some valuable, valuable information here um, for authors and would-be authors. And everybody, I'm going to put everything about Julie up on the blog post and you will be able to connect with her. But Julie, before we sign off, should they just go to your website or email you? What do you prefer? Yeah, actually LinkedIn. Come find me on LinkedIn. Right. Um, I love that. Um, I, I find myself spending more and more time there. So, um, and I'm there every day. So come, come visit me. Weekdays. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I'm on yeah. LinkedIn all the time also. So Julie, mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you for being on Smart Conversations. I can't wait to get this up on the blog. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. Talk to you soon.